So, as you probably know, on the 10th of June earlier this year, there was a national referendum in Switzerland on the introduction of a sovereign money system. So we're here today to speak about um, the lessons that we've learnt from holding this referendum in Switzerland. So I'm going to cover the first part of the talk, a bit of background and a bit of voter perspective, and then Maurizio is going to continue with results analysis and the lessons learnt. So I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to Swiss direct democracy. So in Switzerland, anybody can um, propose a change to the Swiss constitution. And if they can collect 100,000 signatures within an 18-month period, then um, there will be a national referendum. Um, this is explained more in more detail in this brochure, which um, you can pick up more copies outside. And it, it has the um, initiative text, and it explains more about the Swiss democratic system. I should say that this is um, a full sovereign money system whereby only the Swiss National Bank can create money. The banks would no longer be allowed to create the money. So how do voters decide? Well, Swiss people have um, vote four times a year and on each occasion there are usually multiple topics which they're voting on. So they might be voting on the local level about whether um, the local school should have a new sports hall. They might be voting on the cantonal level about whether a railway line should be extended. They might be voting on the national level about whether farmers should be compensated for keeping cows with horns rather than taking them off. Um, this is a vote that's happening tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Um, also, of course, at the national level, they voted on the sovereign money initiative. So how do voters decide? Well, you get this huge envelope that comes, which is packed full of stuff. This one's only the national level. It's got all of these booklets in about um, all of these different things that you're going to vote on. So it's quite hard work being a Swiss citizen because you have to, you get this great pack, you may be up to... I don't know, five to ten different things we've got to vote on. Masses of information about each one of them. So you can imagine people, they sort of open their envelope one day, find this booklet and think, right, let's sit down and do my voting. What's this about? Oh, Fulgeld, what's that? That sounds like something new and strange. Let's read a sentence or two. Gosh, this is really heavy going about the monetary system. Who oh, heck? Um, well, they, so they read this bit here. Then they might um, think, well, let's go straight to see what um, the recommendations are. And they see that the Federal Council is against it. Then they read that in the National Council, 169 politicians were against it and nine were for. And then they read in the Council of States, there were 42 politicians against it and none for it. Now, they might be a little bit more um, um, politically aware, and then they might go to the website of the political party, which um, they typically vote for. And if, if they did that, they would have found for the Sovereign Money Initiative that um, every political party at the national level was against the initiative. Only um, the Green Party um, was um, neither for nor against. So every other party was against it. At the local level, we did have one or two um, parties that were supporting it. So um, if they, um, um, yeah, then they might talk to their friends in the bar after work, they might read newspaper articles, and they might read this leaflet in full if they got more time, they might watch the TV debate, there's almost always a TV debate, and um, that's typically watched by about 130,000 people, and there's speakers um, for and against. And then, of course, there are advertisements, flyers, flyers delivered through the post, online ads, and all of that. But um, only if the topic is very simple or of great interest do people really decide for themselves on the arguments given. So how do the influencers decide? Well, of course, politicians are also very busy people, so they are likely to look to their party's policy, um, unless it's of particular personal interest, and um, they may listen to renowned experts, and um, they debate it in Parliament. 
Um, how do the political parties decide? Well, again, they look at their party policy. Of course, they'll back it if it's in their party policy. Um, and they may organize a debate with inviting experts to speak both for and against it, and then make up their minds. So who are the experts that might be invited along? Well, from our side, we had Raphael Wutrich and Reinhold Haringer and Martin Alder. They all knew the topic absolutely um, back to front, inside out, very, very well, put forward the arguments um, extremely well, um, and um, did a fine job on the TV political debate. Um, yeah, so they did a great job. So our opponents, well, we had Uli Myra, who was on the TV debate. He did a useless job, but he kept on saying, big experiment. Um, we had Sergio Emotti, didn't say very much about the, um, the initiative, apart from it's suicidal, hit all the headlines. Um, then we had Thomas Jordan, the chair of the Swiss National Bank. Now he went around saying, a sovereign money system would hurt our country as a whole and also make it difficult for the Swiss National Bank to fulfill its mandate. Well, pretty tough stuff. And he put in a lot of effort. He gave um, these three official um, talks, he gave newspaper interviews, had an online question and answer session. So, he put a, so it's, it's amazing that a, the current chair of a national bank would give, put so much effort into campaigning against um, a, um, a referendum, an initiative. So why was the Swiss National Bank um, against the initiative? Well, they um, have published their detailed arguments. You can look up these papers perhaps afterwards. We refuted their arguments and um, we didn't really get heard very loudly. So their main arguments, I'll go through them very quickly. Um, first one, big experiment. So but we said, well, today's system is an even bigger experiment. Um, you know, who would have thought 20 years ago we'd have negative interest rates, which we do in Switzerland, or that the SNB would start purchasing um, foreign assets. And in March this year, the SNB had more shares in Facebook than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> um, and we also said, you know, like most of us seem to agree here, that there's a high expectation of another financial crisis. But in Switzerland, people don't feel that they live in an unstable financial system. Quick observation, we had great support from Martin Wolf from the Financial Times, um, who came out strongly in favour of supporting the initiative. However, the Swiss newspapers said, well, why should we be the guinea pig? You know, you go and do it where in your country. Um, then there's political influence. This, the SNB said that they'd um, be exposed to more political influence. We said, well, you already are a bit and you cope with it. And in the text, it says that um, quite clearly that um, politicians can't go to the First National Bank and try and get their pet projects funded. Um, an idea here, which I have thought of afterwards, would it have been easier for us to gain political support if the direct distribution of sovereign money had only been to the citizens and not to the cantons or the government, because we suggested that it could have been to either the citizens or the government or the cantons. Um, then the Swiss National Bank said, well, it'd be a complete upheaval and we'd have to target the quantity of money. Well, this is just simply not true. They clearly could have set an interest rate and um, lent the banks as much money as they liked. Um, and um, yeah, that would be pretty, work pretty much like the system does now. Perhaps we could have made these arguments more prominent. And then they said it would be a credit crunch, not enough credit for, for um, businesses. Well, of course, we answered, well, you know, only if you, the SNB, doesn't, um, don't lend um, enough funds to the banks if, if um, they can't otherwise get hold of the funds they need. And then they said that um, um, they wouldn't be able to deal in foreign assets. Well, this is just simply wrong. They could have dealt in foreign assets, but this is the one point which perhaps we could have made our initiative text um, a little bit clearer and more explicit. So the um, SNB was a big influencer. We didn't have their support, um, and we really needed it. 
So, and you can see from their point of view, I mean, it would have given them a new mandate and new challenges, and frankly, you know, a huge amount of extra work, and they would have been in the world's spotlight. So you can see why they might have been uncomfortable about taking this on. So a big question is sort of how could we have persuaded um, the SNB to support the initiative? And if you're thinking about doing a monetary reform via a political process, I think it's a very relevant question to, um, to, to think about. So I'm going to hand over to Maurizio. Thank you very much, Emma. Now that we've heard how intense the headwinds were from all different sides, especially from the SMB, let's have a look at the result of the vote. So this is a table that uh, indicates the amount of uh, yes votes we got in uh, different language regions and um, types of settlement. And uh, um, overall in Switzerland, so what, what we achieved, we got 24.3% um, of uh, people voting in favor of the implementation of uh, sovereign money Folgeld um, reform. What is very interesting when we look at this table is that the difference between um, the places where people were most in favor, like in uh, French-speaking uh, Switzerland uh, city centers with 32.6%, uh, and um, the places where, where people were least in favor in the rural um, German-speaking communities, this difference is actually very small. It's only um, around 11%. This, is, um, this indicates that the usual political fault lines actually didn't really show up. So this um, map here actually illustrates very nicely um, how homogeneous uh, the voting outcome actually was. Most of the cantons um, in Switzerland, in most of the cantons in Switzerland, um, only 20 to 30 percent of the uh, of the people actually voted in favor of the reform. We have a few statistical outliers: the canton uh, of Geneva with 40.3 percent saying yes, and the canton of uh, Obwalden. Um, with only 70.9% saying yes. Um, another noteworthy aspect um, of the vote is the, the voting participation, which uh, was unusually low. The voting participation was 33.8%, and it was uh, the lowest in Switzerland since 2006. The average voting participation is 46.5%. Um, we collected uh, 400, roughly 450,000 uh, yes votes. So I want to make a quick comparison to the basic income vote of 2016. Um, they, the voting participation there was 46.4%, uh, so, and they got, they got more yes votes. But the point that I want to make is uh, a higher voting participation must not necessarily lead to more yes votes in percent. The basic income got only 23.1% uh, of uh, yes votes. Uh, after, the, after the vote, we conducted the survey because we wanted to learn more about our impact, uh, the campaign, uh, the, the impact of the campaign. Uh, we did a survey uh, together with the Link Institute. It's a well-known institute for political service in Switzerland. Um, we asked around 1,000 people in the age of 15 to 79 in French and German-speaking Switzerland. Um, we asked the question, what do you think who creates most of the money in Switzerland? This was after the campaign. And incorrectly, 60% said, uh, the, the, uh, the, most of the people think that, that uh, the SMB creates uh, most of the, of the money. Uh, after, this was after the, after the campaign. And only 30% of the people think that private banks create uh, the, the most um, amount of money in Switzerland. And then we ask, what do you think who should be allowed to create uh, most money in Switzerland? And here, 80% of the people actually said only the SMB should have the privilege to create money, and only 10% are in favor that uh, private banks can create uh, money. This is astonishing. So if only 10% of the people think that private banks should create money, how is it possible that 76% uh, actually voted um, in favor of private money creation? So well, this is, uh, this is an important question we have to debate. So an answer is that if 60% think that, already, that the SMB already creates most of the money, so it just doesn't make sense to vote for Folgeld. 
So, and what we, what we definitely know now is that 60% are still unaware how the system actually functions even after our campaign. And um, we know that, um, that there's a big discrepancy between the status quo and, and what people actually want, because 80% of the people, according to our survey, feel that only the SMB should uh, create money. Um, I think the media was a very important stakeholder, and it is a very important stakeholder for uh, all uh, Swiss people's initiatives. So I want to quickly talk about the media coverage. The media didn't like the Folgard reform at all. We can say that. The University of Zurich analyzed more than 200 articles that were published from March to June, just before the voting date, and they found that almost every article and uh, every comment um, published was with a negative uh, tonality. On an international level, the situation is uh, a little bit uh, more balanced. Uh, the international commentators actually had more the attitude, we heard it already from Emma, that uh, yeah, let's, let's look at what happens in Switzerland and then we can learn from uh, what, what the outcome is. So, do we have to say that the media coverage was all bad for us? And I would say definitely not, because what happened is that Journalists, they just kept repeating, banks create the, the, the biggest amount of money and, and they actually started uh, debating um, what what's the, the consequences of it is. So, um, because they kept repeating that it's actually the banks that create money and, and then started asking what the role of the banks are and what the role of the SMB should be, they kind of um, helped that this, uh, this fact becomes general knowledge. And as we heard before, if you want to reform a system, you actually have to agree on how the system works today. Last but not least, um, let's uh, come to the lessons learned. First of all, a Swiss People's Initiative is a great tool to raise awareness for a specific subject on a national and on an international level. It can help facilitate change, but to be honest, Today, I have to say, it's probably not a good tool to implement change because a Swiss People's Initiative is very hard to win. It's uh, only every tenth uh, Swiss People's uh, Initiative actually is uh, successful. But um, the first step of a monetary reform is to raise awareness that the monetary system actually can be reformed. So I think that uh, the, the, the Folgeld Initiative was very useful because it triggered this debate. So even if, the, if, we, if we ended up losing the vote, we actually triggered the debate and therefore we triggered the process of monetary reform. An important lesson for us, I guess, was that you have to include at least some of the important stakeholders. So when you draft a, a concept or a if you design a reform proposal, you maybe want to sit together with important stakeholders and see what their, what their opinion is. This uh, would actually help a lot to, to be successful. Well, another point is, um, this was uh, my personal experience during the campaign, that it would be ha very helpful if your reform proposal is backed by peer-reviewed quantitative research that estimates the impact of the reform on a country's um, economy. If you don't have that, it's very difficult to, to talk to technocrats at the SMB or also at the, uh, at the, at the government. More generally, one can say that the monetary reform proposal must use tools and language that make sense for the audience that is addressed. So you, you, use, you refer to, to quantitative methods when you talk to technocrats and you use words that people on the street really un, uh, understand, that they can make sense of and can remember. Um, the last two points probably um, as well belong together. A monetary reform proposal needs to respect that change happens at the margin in a democracy. So therefore, a monetary reform should be a step-by-step, long-term operation. Hence, uh, advocates of monetary reform may consider identifying, branding, and promoting single, single steps instead of um, all-at-once monetary reform. Thank you. Okay, we have quite some time left for questions. Uh, maybe only, only a small comment. Um, 
So there was also, also very positive effects on, on the German debate. It was not only Switzerland, so we are very thankful that you didn't think before uh, all these things, you, because we probably wouldn't have started it. But uh, <laughs> 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 So for us, uh, also in Germany, it very, really triggered the debate and uh, it was very, very positive. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got a question concerning the survey you mentioned. Um, was it a representative a survey or was it only a survey among uh, your followers? No, it was a representative survey. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, I copped a fair bit of flack for supporting your initiative uh, from my circles in monetary analysis, as you can imagine. And a large part of why I did was I thought, well, simply you, you are doing what the previous speaker questioner said, you're raising awareness about it, and that in itself is worthwhile. But just one little cautionary thing that I've realized myself, would, would anybody in this room be sitting here if we we're having a conference on car engines? How many people here own a car? And how many of you would be in this room if there's a conference on cars? The answer is almost none, I think. In other words, the fact that we're fascinated by it doesn't mean the general public is. Mm. And it's only when our cars break down that we care about how our cars function. And the same thing applies to the monetary system. So it's a real challenge to raise your level of awareness mm. to a public which basically expects it to work and doesn't really know how it works, just like I really don't know how a modern car works, but I still intend hopping in one to get to, get to the airport. So it's a real challenge we face to raise that awareness. And I congratulate you on trying. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to say that we, um, hans Rudi Weber actually started um, thinking about this straight after the financial crisis. And first of all, he had to collect together some university professors who then had to write the text. And then, was it 2013, the text was more or less finished and we started collecting signatures 2014. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the whole process in Switzerland takes that long. It has to go to a committee in the Federal Council, it has to go to committees in Parliament, and the, yeah, so we weren't, you know, that was out of our control. So, unfortunately, it, yeah, we couldn't sort of make it happen, you know, in 2009, which, of course, might have been a bit better. Um, now that the referendum is over, I wonder, uh, the group of people <laughs> who has initiated it, has it stayed together or disassembled? And uh, if you stay together, what are the next steps? What are your plans? Yeah, well, actually, we're in, at the moment, restructuring. So this is a big question for everyone who participated. Some people already said they probably will relax a little bit after the four years of uh, a very intense campaign. And uh, others are very keen on um, trying to... to uh, uh, continue and first analyze what actually, what actually, where we stand now, and what could be a useful thing to do next. So, we, but we we don't want to rush into it. So, first comes now the the analysis analysis of where we where do we stand, and um, and uh, what uh, there is a group uh, the the association is still the same who who carried the the initiative, and um, it's it's operational. And um, we, we, um, we are planning to start new projects at uh, Q1 um, next, next year. And then we'll, we'll um, eventually see um, as well how many of our supporter base is still, uh, are still willing to, to carry on because it's also a matter of, uh, of, of financing, of course. So um, we don't know yet how many of the people who actually financed the campaign are now still on board. And we have to figure out um, how how it all works out, um, and, and um, then we'll decide. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am still fascinated by this concept, and uh, may I just simply ask, what would have happened in case of success? You have shockingly <laughs> been put from theory to practice, <laughs> and what would you have A, to the Swiss franc and the Swiss economy, B, to the S&B, and yeah, Mr. Jordan, thank you. Should I? Um, yeah, I, I mean, if, you know, in Switzerland, is, um, it's always uh, a big question. If, if, the, if um, Swiss People's Initiative is successful, then what happens is that you, you change constitutional text, nothing else. 
then the, 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 the whole thing, the whole system continues to operate. So everyone would have to think about, so how, how do we interpret the text now? So then, then politicians come together, expert groups are formed, and then you start uh, trying to figure out how, we, how can we interpret this text and, and, um, and create law and you know, create a new mandate for the SMB. And this process uh, sometimes takes a very, uh, very long time. Yes. Yes, but you know, in, in, when you when you look at other initiatives that passed, then the translation of the uh, of the constitutional text wasn't very into law, wasn't very close to the idea of the constitutional text. And then you have the different um, members of uh, parties who actually then say, you know, this is this is not what the constitution says. So the whole process in that in in this scenario would be you have to. You have to go the legal way, and in the end, the the, uh, the court, the highest court, decides if the interpretation of the legal text is too far uh, uh, away, if the constitutional text is too far away from the law. But I, I don't remember a case uh, when this when this happened. So I think Swiss Swiss government is always very pragmatic, and, and they will find a way to kind of tweak everything so that. That um, that every every interest group is happy with the with the situation. I heard rumors that you are suing or will sue some of your adversaries for spreading false facts. Is that true? Yes. Um, yeah. We 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 did intervene. And there is um, no final, uh, no final result. So it's still at the highest court. And we said that what was written in this book, in this book and what was said by the S and B, um, is is uh, too far away from what actually is the truth. Yeah. So they they, they made out that um, all of the money would have to be spent into circulation rather than lent into circulation. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. So that um, and obviously this is quite a big deviation from what because we were saying it could be either spent into circulation or lent into circulation. Yes. So. So you see, there are, there are already different interpretation of the, of, of the text we propose and of uh, possible outcomes, or even before the constitutional text um, is in the constitution. Um, we heard uh, from different other speakers that uh, a very important point in monetary reform is psychology. And I think you now are the group with the most experience. You talk to a lot of people. And uh, so what are your experience, what words can be used, uh, what shouldn't you use, um, uh, what was very, uh, what would you say today, what, what's your psychological experience with, with uh, Volker? <laughs> um, I think I, I find it quite um, challenging being out on the street collecting signatures, which I did a little bit of. I think for some people straight away, um, you know, there's a little sort of feeling that against bankers that um, you know they'd messed up with the financial crisis, and of course you can connect to them very quickly. Um, with other people who've never thought about money and haven't, you know, it is it's very much more challenging. Um, yeah, what's your experience? I, I, th I think <laughs> it was very difficult for people to remember what we actually want and what the reform does. So. If you don't have a, a, a small idea about accounting, then you have no chance to remember what the, actual, the reform actually does to the central bank and, and what, the, uh, what the reform does to the bank and if it's good or not. You cannot debate. Mm -hmm. So I live together with, uh, with uh, architects and mathematicians and you know, smart people. And I explained it over and over and over again. And even after a year, they came to me and said, can you, can you tell me again what, was, what, it, what it's about? Mm -hmm. So 
this is the, the, the Fallgeld reform comes with so many different aspects. It's a highly complex issue that it's very difficult for people to, to get it and to remember it. And then, you know, if, if, you, want to have, if you want to promote a, a reform, you, you need to make sure that if you explain it once or twice and then you convince somebody, that this person can go and tell his friend. And then this, his friend can tell his friend. So, so it spreads. And, and, and I guess Folgat as, uh, as a concept is too complex to do that. I also find it, had so m it has, in my view, so many advantages, it's quite hard to know what to focus on, so that um, you know, I, I believe strongly it would help um, reduce inequality. I believe that it will help with environmental sustainability. Um, you, know, you can have a, um, a banking system whereby banks can go bankrupt, so it helps, helps you if you come from you know, you're wanting to have the, the market forces. And it, there's so many advantages, and obviously different advantages speak to different people, but that, that, it's also quite difficult in our campaign because it perhaps dil dilutes the message a little bit. Okay, if there are no further questions, then thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm.